All right, thank you and welcome to the online foundation meeting. We're going to be talking about some of the nitty gritty details about what you'll be thinking about as you get ready to apply to medical, dental, optometry, podiatry, and veterinary school. We're really starting to think about the actual application itself in this piece. Next week, you're going to have the personal statement workshop. And so this is kind of a prelude to that in some ways and in some ways kind of getting you to think about what you've accomplished and how you're going to showcase your accomplishments. So you've done a lot of the work that you need to be doing to be ready to apply to your program. The next piece of what you need to do is really important, right? You're going to be getting ready to present yourself to the schools. And I can't stress enough how important it is to really take the time and think about how you're going to present yourself to the schools. Almost think about yourself as a product that you're going to market to the schools. You've spent you know, somewhere between three and seven years putting together your set of experiences and your education. You're gonna put it on an application that the admission staff is going to read. And that first read through is gonna take them about 15 minutes. So you're really complex people. You've got a lot of things that you've accomplished. How are you going to consolidate all of that down into information that can be read in about 15 minutes? And so you really want to think about what are the things that you've done? Because if you don't share that with the admissions people and you don't share that in a way that they can understand and that is meaningful to them, then they're not going to be looking at you as a serious applicant. So you want to take all of the things that you've done and highlight it in a way that is important to them and in a way that they find helpful and useful. And so you really want to start thinking about that now and you want to be thinking about that. And I know Dr. Begley will talk about that next week in the um, personal statement workshop. And then we'll talk about it online as well in the virtual personal statement workshop. Thinking about, okay, how do I write about my experiences in a way that's going to be useful to the admissions committees because, again, it's really important that what you talk about from your experiences is the piece of those experiences that's going to be useful to the medical schools and the dental schools and the programs that you're applying to. Now, obviously, the first thing that's going to be important to the schools are the numbers, um, your GPA, your entrance exam score, be it MCAT, DAT, or GRE. And I think probably I've talked to most of you about this, that most schools will typically do sort of a first review. Some of the schools even call it a screening where they look at your GPA and your MCAT score, your DAT score, your GRE score, and they say, does this applicant look like they have the metrics, the numbers to be successful in our program? Do they look like somebody who's going to be able to pass their board exams? Um, they're not going to want to accept you if it doesn't seem like you're going to be successful, right? They don't want you to, you know, spend all that money and not pass, and they don't want to give you a seat that they could have given to somebody else if you're not going to be successful. So kind of a double-edged sword there. So those numbers are really important in the first step of the review process. Once they've looked at your numbers, the GPA and the MCAT score, and said, okay, yeah, we think that this applicant looks like they're a good applicant, then they're going to drill down to the next level of the application. And that's when they're really going to start looking at all of your other accomplishments, your research experience, your clinical, your community service experience, all of those core competencies that we've been talking about and how you're different from other applicants. So, you know, with your um, 
experiences that you're talking about. You really want to be talking about how is your research experience meaningful, right? They don't want to know, oh yeah, I was in a lab, I cleaned glassware. That's, I mean, that's nice. And for a lot of you guys, your first lab experiences, you were cleaning glassware, or you were doing something that was really basic. It's important. I mean, the glassware needs to be cleaned, right? And so it's an important part of what happens in the lab. But what's really important to them is what you learned while you, you were in the lab that you will take into your role as a doctor. So they want to know, what did you learn about the hypothesis? What did you learn about um, the research that was going on around you? What did you learn about testing a hypothesis, about getting results? What did you learn about the research process? And some of what you learn about the research process, and I think a lot of what you may learn about the research process in those first um, experiences is, wow, research is frustrating. You know, you don't always get the results that you're hoping for. Sometimes you're trying and trying and things aren't working out, and then you have to problem solve and um, figure out different ways to understand what's going on and to get results. And so, and that's really valuable experience. So you want to really be thinking about what are they looking for because the problem solving, critical thinking, um, that's really important because that's something that you have to do in medicine as well, number one in research, but then number two with diagnostics and with treatment. You know, you have a patient who's not getting better, you have to do that same problem solving and that same, okay, well, how can we figure this out differently? So you're talking about those transferable skills when you're talking about your research. And even if it was research where you were not um, playing the biggest role in the end product, what you want to be focusing on is what you contributed and also what you learned and what you took away from that research. Um, you also really want to be able to differentiate yourself from other applicants. And this, again, is sort of that branding piece or talking about yourself and giving a general sense of, you know, who are you? So, you know, if you were watching a bunch of different, for example, car commercials, you would see that Volkswagen and BMW and Honda, they all sort of market themselves differently. You're doing the same sort of thing, except you're not a car, you're talking about yourself as a person so that they get this understanding of, okay, who is this person as an individual? A lot of the time people think, oh, I have to do something um, totally unique or different or awesome or impressive or crazy or really out there to gather their attention. You don't need to do that. You just need to show them who you are, right? When we go shopping for cars, we look at the cars out there, we buy a car, right? The car doesn't have to stand on its head. I mean, maybe that's not the best metaphor out there. Um, but you guys have really good experiences. You've done what you need to do, hopefully. If you haven't, then you probably want to think, okay, maybe I need to do what I need to do and, and take another year before I apply. But if you've done what you need to do, you have the grades, you have the experiences, what you need to do then is just showcase it, these experiences and show who you are and what you've done to the schools. That's all you need to do. Don't try and stand on your head. Don't try and be unique or different. Um, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking to get to know who you are as an individual. I can't emphasize that enough that that's all you need to do. You don't need to, to try something crazy or unique. Being yourself really, 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 truly is enough. Um, it, it, it's all they're looking for is who are you. Um, on your application, you're going to include things that are not research, clinical, and service, right? Uh, publications, poster presentations, conference attendance. You want to include those as experiences. Obviously, publications are 
amazing things to have. We all know that research does not work in a nice, convenient way where, you know, you do a research project and then you're ready to apply to medical school and um, boom, naturally you have a publication ready to go, right? Research works at its own pace. So you may or may not have a publication and the schools know that. They know that, you know, some people are just going to be lucky in their timing and how their research falls into place and other people, it's not going to work out quite that way. They want to know that you have the ambition to have publications. You know, if you did a poster presentation, if you took the time and attended a conference, those are things that are important to them as well. On the applications, they'll actually ask about language ability. Um, you know, they don't necessarily care if you have a minor in a language. They care more that you can speak a language, and they will actually ask that on the application. One thing I would definitely say, and we'll talk about this again when we're talking about filling out the applications, don't exaggerate your language ability. Um, you know, really think about, okay, what is my language level? Um, if you exaggerate and you say, oh, yeah, I'm totally fluent when you're not, you run the risk of having an interviewer who is also fluent and wants to conduct the interview in that language. And, you know, that that could be a hindrance to you if you're not truly fluent. They're really interested in leadership positions in clubs and sports teams and lab teams. Um, there are a wide variety of different ways that you can get leadership experiences. Um, being an RA is a leadership experience. So, you know, think about are there ways that you can showcase your leadership abilities? Um, if you had a part-time job and you worked to support yourself or to help pay your bills during your undergraduate experience, that's something that you're going to talk about as well. And sometimes people will say, oh, well, I just was a waitress or I was just a bartender. That doesn't really count. Actually, that's something that the schools really do want to know about. There is, number one, there's a lot of crossover between, um, you know, positions in the service industry and in medicine because medicine is a service profession. But also there is something to be said for, you know, okay, I need to pay my bills, so I'm going to get a job and it might not be glamorous, um, but this is what I need to do. And so I'm going to do it. Um, that's something that they respect. Um, being a mentor, those are really great things. International experience is also really great. They really like it when applicants get outside of their bubble and meet people who are different from them. Now, getting it outside of the bubble does not require international experience. There's quite a lot of uh, different cultures and different people living right here in Boston. So you can meet people who are different from you um, in a variety of different ways right here in the city. Um, and that's that's great as well. Um, but you do want to, if possible, highlight a time or a couple times in your application where you were working with people who are different from you. And that may be, you know, you worked with people who are different from you in a lab. It may be that you worked with people who are different from you when you were tutoring or in a um, community service program. When you're writing descriptions of your experiences, you're going to try using action words. You don't want to be too zealous on the adjectives. Um, you don't want to dwell on tasks too much. Instead, you want to be talking about contributions and learning. One thing that I've heard people say, don't use the word I too much when you're talking about um, your accomplishments. I know it, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it can come across a little bit arrogant if you're saying I too much on your application. Um, I actually have heard people who were waitlisted at schools who were able to talk to somebody from admissions and got feedback that they used I too much in their application and they, they sounded a little bit arrogant. They don't want you to be arrogant until you're a practicing physician, apparently. Um, so, you know, when you're putting together descriptions of your experiences, you want to try, I mean, obviously you're going to have to use the word I some, but you really want to try to sound um, humble, but at the same time to sound, you know, to be, to, 
take credit for what you've done, which is a delicate balancing act. That's why we're talking about it here in November instead of in May, because you are going to want to start talking about some of the experiences that you've had and start writing up some of those descriptions. Now, that's something that you're going to be putting in your medical applicant portal. So you'll be writing up those descriptions before your committee letter interview. Um, those descriptions will then go on your application. So for MD applications, you have the opportunity to put 15 activities and experiences in addition to your personal statement. The dental ones are a little bit shorter. Um, you, you can write, they don't exactly have a limit on the number of descriptions, but you get a lot fewer characters. So they're really one sentence descriptions. So you really have to consider every single word that you put into those descriptions. You don't get a lot of opportunity to describe what you're doing. And the DO applications, again, you get more, um, you, they don't necessarily limit how many experiences you talk about. The descriptions are briefer, but they're much longer than the dental experiences. So for particularly MD and DO experiences, you want really rich descriptions. Um, for veterinary schools, optometry and podiatry, you also do get to write a little bit more about your descript or your activities. So you really want to start now um, writing about your experiences so that when the time comes to put together your application, you're not doing those write-ups last minute. It's really important that you write rich descriptions that um, are framed in terms of the AAMC competencies that really showcase what all your accomplishments have been as an undergraduate in your gap year so that they can see all of the things that you have achieved. You want to be thinking about what admissions committees are really interested in. When you're putting together your application, you're putting it together for one purpose only, and that's admission to um, medical school or dental school, optometry, podiatry, veterinary school. So I've seen people start their personal statement with something that said, my friend, my best friend said, blah, 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 blah. Or I asked, I couldn't figure out how to start this. So my best, I asked my best friend and she said, blah, blah, blah. They don't want to hear it. Um, if you need your best friend's opinion, then you're not confident enough in your own ability. So, you know what, if you feel that way, you can write your first draft that way, and that is totally fine. You can even write your second draft that way. But by the time that it goes on your application, um, cut your best friend out. Um, it's fine to be starting out that way, and it is really hard to talk about yourself. So, you know, it does take a little while to put things together. Um, and that, again, why we're starting it now. Typically, things from high school are not going to go on your application unless it's something that's really pivotal. Um, so if you were an Eagle Scout, if you're a National Merit Scholar, um, if you had a publication in high school, if you did something in high school that you continued on with through college, those things typically don't go on your application. If there's something that happened in high school or before high school that's part of your journey that is, you know, why you're interested in medicine, that can become part of your personal statement and it frequently does. Um, again, you know, you're not going to in your um, personal statement be talking about, I don't want to be a lawyer. They don't care. Um, they want to know why you want to be a doctor. And we also encourage you to steer clear, clear of um, quotes in your personal statements because, um, you know, they want to know what you think, not what Gandhi thinks, not what Martin Luther King thinks. They've read all of the quotes that there are to read, and, um, you know, they want to know what you have to say. Um, in terms of hobbies, you know, there are some hobbies that you would put on there. And if you have something that you do that really takes up a lot of your time and is something that's kind of 
a big piece of who you are. You know, you do yoga every day, you meditate every day, you really love to hike, or you play an instrument, but you're no longer um, actively in a group, or maybe you are in a group, but you're not performing right now. That's something that you can put on your application, but you're not going to put every single small thing that you do on your application. Something that rounds out who you are and kind of showcases, you know, I love to run. I ran a marathon. It wasn't a part of any formal group. It's just something that I did. Those are things that they like to know about because, again, it, it shows a piece of who you are. Um, but you're not, that's not necessarily that showcase of your application and you don't want it to be too big of a chunk of your application. It's more something that rounds out your application and kind of helps demonstrate your brand and who you are as a person. So that's something that you can include in MAP in terms of your activities and in terms of things that you're going to be talking about. But um, you really want to be thinking about and focusing on what are all the things that I've done um, as a part of my undergrad and my postgrad experiences if you're doing gap years until now. And that's what you're going to be presenting to the admissions committee. So our first deadline is coming up. It's still a couple months off, but the time is going to go a lot faster than you can imagine. Um, you're going to get to your self-assessment pretty soon. Um, and you will, you know, you'll be like, whoa, this is a lot of stuff. If you haven't looked at the self-assessment yet, you should definitely look at that self-assessment because there's a lot of information that you need to be filling out. Uh, it is 17 pages long. It's very extensive. It is not something that we put together to torture you. Um, and I think most of you who have gotten to this point realize that, that it is designed to help you with your application. Really take it seriously. Don't sit down the night before, the week before, to complete your self-assessment. I think a lot of people get started on their self-assessment and they start writing notes to themselves about it and what they want to put on it. And they flesh out the final details in, in the last couple of weeks, particularly if, they're, if you're taking a January MCAT, you may do some of your last write-up in that last week. But it is really important that you spend the time putting together meaningful, thoughtful remarks on your self-assessment. If you submit your self-assessment before January 31st, um, feel free to send me an email and just let me know that your self-assessment is uploaded. One of the unfortunate quirks of the MAP system is that I can't see that you've submitted your self-assessment. So February 1st, uh, it will get a report from IT about everybody who submitted a self-assessment. And Ms. Wolfson and I will go through all of them and give you individual feedback and just let you know, you know, this looks good or, oh, I see you don't necessarily have a lot of research experience seems like you might need to get that or, you know, um, I'm noticing you don't have a lot of information about why your research is important. I think you really need to do some thinking about that information. So we will give you feedback on your self-assessment um, individually. The self-assessment, number one, is designed to help you assess if this is the best year to apply. Number two, we really use those self-assessments. I can tell you that the self-assessments, when I put together your committee letters, one of the things that I really strongly look at are those self-assessments. So people frequently ask me, how can I get, ensure that I get a good committee letter? And I can tell you, do a good job on your self-assessment because that's really going to help me with the committee letter. Just as the medical schools only know the things that you share with them, I also only know the things that you've shared with me. And so the only things that I have to write about you are the things that I know about you. Now, we'll have a committee letter interview and we'll talk about those things. 
Um, and, you know, if you're somebody who's met with me over the years, I'll have the things that we've discussed in our meetings. But one of the really good places that I get information about you and I am able to understand what you've learned from your experiences is the self-assessment. So really take the time to do a good job on your self-assessment. That's going to significantly impact your committee letter in that we'll know more about you and we'll be able to write at a deeper level about your experiences and understanding what you learned from those experiences. I think also um, the self-assessment is a really good tool for you as you prepare for interviews, which admittedly is not for a while, but having done all of the thought about your activities and what you learned from them, going over that before, you know, as you're preparing for interviews and as you're getting ready for interviews gives you, again, the opportunity to think about, okay, what's the body of my experiences? How do I want to present myself? What did I learn from those interviews? So that you can really talk about those things knowledgeably at an interview. Um, if you're feeling nervous or anxious at an interview, you're able to kind of reflect back on things that you've been thinking about for a long time. So you're able to talk really well about what you've learned and what you've taken away from your experiences. The clinical experiences that you've had, for example, they're not going to be what you are doing as a physician, right? Maybe you worked as a medical assistant. You're not going to be a medical assistant, um, you know, in medical school. But those skills that you got as a medical assistant are going to be so key for you as a springboard in medical school. And so the schools are going to want to know, well, what, you know, that you've learned as a medical assistant are you going to bring forward with you? And having really thought about that and fleshed that out, being able to talk about that um, at a really high level and a really reflective level is going to be so important for helping you out with your interview. So really take the time starting now to go through the self-assessment, do a good job on it, um, let us know if you let me know if you submitted it earlier, and I'll I'll look through it and get back to you with feedback. Um, and remember, it's a self assessment and the applicant agreement that are due January thirty first. Those are our first deadlines. Um, finally, we'll have a um, a workshop about school choice that will start that will be in January. It's always a good time to start thinking about schools. Um, sc thinking about your schools should be fun. For folks who are applying to MD programs, um, for folks who don't know about the MSAR, if you Google M-S-A-R-A-A-M-C, MSAR stands for Medical School Admissions Requirements. It's a resource put together by AAMC. It costs, I believe, $27 for access for a year, but it's really well worth it. We'll talk about this again in January, but I recommend paying for the $27 and using that as a starting point for your research, but you really want to be doing individual research on the different schools. Um, all of the schools are going to be asking you, why do you want to come here? And your answer cannot be, it's sunny 360 days a year. They don't care. If um, you enjoy the sunshine, they want to know why you are interested in their program. Um, also, if you are at all worried about, you know, am I ready to apply this year, definitely feel free to set up an appointment with me. I do Skype appointments. I'm happy to Skype with you or talk over the phone. Um, and, um, you know, talk about your readiness. You really only want to go through the process once. And um, it's important to be strategic in your planning and think about what are my goals? What outcome do I want here? And um, am I ready for that goal? You know, some people are kind of thinking, I really want to go to a top level school. I want to go to Harvard or Stanford. And for that applicant, your, you know, GPA MCAT requirement may be different for the applicant who's thinking, my goal is to get into my state school. I like the tuition 
that they've got there. And my end goal is to be a clinician who's spending every day working with patients and spending time in the clinic. And yes, I want research to inform my practice. And, you know, I'd like to be somebody who's able to carry out a research study if I, when I find that thing in medicine that drives me nuts, I want to be able to impact change on it. Um, but, you know, those two applicants may very well have different profiles when they're applying and what's ready for one applicant may not be ready for another. So you really want to be thinking about where do you want to go to school? Am I ready for my end goal? Um, we, are, we are asking people to submit your applicant agreement after you complete your self-assessment. The applicant agreement when you complete it, it's a Google form. It will go to an Excel spreadsheet, and um, I can see the Excel spreadsheet, so I'll have a sense of who's applying. After um, January 31st, I'm going to use that Excel spreadsheet as the list of applicants that we have. So rather than sending things to everybody on that list, I'm going to start sending things to people who have filled out the um, applicant agreement. And um, that Excel spreadsheet will help us to get a sense of, okay, these people have submitted applicant agreements. So we know to be looking at, you know, for the applicant agreement so we can start giving people feedback. Um, it, it just makes things a little bit easier. If you've already submitted your applicant agreement, don't worry about it. Don't sweat the details on that one. It just does make it a little bit easier for us. So that's kind of the general information that I wanted to go over today. Uh, I'd like to open this to questions. I, I do have everybody's um, microphones muted, but if you want to include things or type questions in the chat window, and I'm going to stop the recording right now. So for folks watching at home, thank you for attending. And if you do have questions, if you're watching the recording of this, um, definitely feel free to send me an email.